welcome to this Bible study on uh, discovering Mary in the Bible. Okay, and we'll start with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, as we embark on this study of the Scriptures, we pray that you help us to discover your mother more, so that as she takes us by the hand, she will lead us closer to you. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And Mother Mary, we ask for your intercession as we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Okay, so for this study, uh, that is called Discovering Mary in the Bible, the main resource uh, will be this book by Bran Petrie called uh, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of Mary. He wrote also some other books uh, also called uh, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist. This book focuses entirely on uh, Mary and uh, it's, uh, it draws from the time of Jesus, the Jewish understanding. Uh, it draws from the tradition of the church, but most of all it draws from scripture itself. And so it's, it's in some way very much a Bible study book. Most of what I'm going to say is not going to be a, any new invention. Uh, it's pretty much entirely based on what Brad Petrie uh, teaches about Mary from Scripture. But it's, it, it makes a, a lot of sense. Uh, it, it was uh, quite a joy for me to, to go through this book, uh, most of which, which I read when I was on retreat earlier this year. And so I'll, I'll share from that point of view uh, with, with you. So uh, that's why we will open the Scriptures a lot um, and, and, and look at uh, what the scripture has to say about Mary uh, and I will also at times refer to the Catechism of the Catholic Church which is uh, kind of the uh, compendium of what we believe as a church and again the, the Catechism itself will draw from scripture and from tradition so we'll make some quite a lot of references to that. Okay, This uh, first session I will focus on Mary as the new Eve. Okay. Uh, uh, quite a few of you have, have shared that when it comes to Mary as Catholics, sometimes we feel a little bit alone because uh, our separated brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, uh, Protestants may often question us or even blatantly attack us on our Marian devotion and how Marian devotion in their eyes may not be scriptural or even anti-scriptural uh, and why do you need Mary in the first place? Doesn't Scripture say that there is one mediator between God and us, which is Jesus Christ? And uh, we will not disagree with that Scripture passage. Yes, indeed, there is one mediator, and it is Jesus. So how do we understand our devotion to Mary? Why is it important? And where do we find it in Scripture? When I was preparing yesterday at home, uh, I mean my final preparations, and my, my wife uh, walked in. Uh, she knows I'm doing Bible study, and she didn't know I was doing a Bible study on Mary. So she said, oh, since when are you doing a Bible study on Mary? I don't come from a very Marian family when I grew up. Uh, I mean, grew up in a Catholic family. Uh, once in a while, we may say uh, Hail Mary. Uh, growing up, we had no negativity towards Mary, but we didn't have any... It wasn't like a, a family where Marian devotion is like a, the, the end all and be all of the family. When later on I, in life, I went to the seminary, one of my classmates, who has become a priest now, uh, he grew up in quite a different family, which Marian devotion was, uh, uh, was very high in, 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 in their faith. And so I quickly realized that uh, when you grow up in a very Marian family or not, some things that you, that you learn as a child will stay with you and, and you will connect with that very easily because you grew up that uh, as a child and it's kind of the this, this second nature. This may not for all Catholics be the case. Some Catholics uh, have a very strong Marian devotion. Others uh, may not have such a strong Marian devotion. And that's okay. Along the way, hopefully, we will discover the importance of Mary in our life and in our faith journey and why Jesus on the cross gave Mary to all of us as the beloved disciple to become our mother and to walk with us in that journey of faith. As many of the saints have pointed out uh, that it is Mary who will bring us to Jesus. The Montfort that said, uh, to Jesus through Mary. Uh, it is Mary that brings us uh, to her son. Uh, whoever discovers Mary will eventually discover Jesus in a deeper way. And that is the beauty of our Marian devotion. 
And so we try to discover a little bit more of uh, the importance of Mary, the significance of Mary. And hopefully this study will help you discover that how biblical it is and where are these passages in Scripture that will help us to discover the significance of Mary. In quite a few of our devotions, we refer to Mary as the Queen of Heaven, and rightly so. Actually, yesterday we celebrated the Solemnity of the Assumption, which is pretty much uh, linked with the, the idea of that Mary becomes the Queen of Heaven. She was assumed into heaven uh, in, the, in the mysteries of the Rosary. Uh, one is the Assumption in Mary, the next devotion is the Coronation, uh, that, that Mary becomes the Queen of Heaven. Now, we of course have to see all of that in the context of Jesus. Whatever we are going to address about Mary can only really be seen in the light of Jesus. Uh, that Jesus honors his mother in, in this way to assume her body and soul into heaven and then to make her the queen of heaven. Perhaps if Protestants will attack us on anything, uh, it will be on this title, the queen uh, of heaven. And if you have a Bible with me, with you, you can perhaps open Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 17 and 18. Uh, Jeremiah prophesying to the people, maybe I'll read from verse 16, uh, the title in the NRSV is The People's Disobedience. As for you, do not pray for these people. Do not raise a cry or prayer on their behalf and do not intercede with me, for I will not hear you. Do you not see what they are doing in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, the fathers kindle fire, and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven, and they pour out drink offering to other gods to provoke me to anger. Jeremiah brings up the queen of heaven, and this queen of heaven is clearly an idol. This queen of heaven is clearly a false god to whom the people are making some kind of worship offering by baking cakes and so on, and God rebukes them for it. And so a Protestants will, may quickly pick up on this passage and say, you are calling Mary queen of heaven, are you not falling into the idolatry that Jeremiah is talking about? Now, this queen of heaven that Jeremiah is talking about obviously is not Mary. This title, um, the title that we give Mary as the queen of heaven has a very different source. And so to link these two uh, makes no sense. This queen of heaven in Jeremiah uh, is obviously not about Mary. Uh, this is clearly about idolatry. Whereas the devotion to Mary uh, is far from idolatry. And, and in later sessions, I'll come back to that on what is the distinction between uh, our Marian devotion uh, versus what we call the worship of God. Because Scripture clearly teaches us that we shall worship God and God alone. Now, as Catholics, we do not worship Mary. Once we raise Mary to the level of deity, to the level of God, then we are, that is no longer Catholic devotion. The Catholic devotion is for the Mother of Christ, who is fully human and human alone. She is not God. Uh, she didn't pre-exist from of all eternity, no. Uh, she is human like you and I. But she plays a very pivotal role, a very key role in the story of salvation because she was chosen by God to become the mother of Christ. And in that role as the mother of Christ, and nursing him, feeding him, working with him, not just in his childhood days, but even all the way till the cross, she plays that key role um, as his mother. Why, therefore, at the end of her life, she is assumed into heaven and made the, the queen of heaven, uh, but not the queen up and above God as if she supersedes God. No, uh, God is the king of the universe. And so what role does she play as queen uh, is something we're going to discover in this series. I, I think next week we will come back uh, to... Uh, what kind of queen she is and how to understand that from the Jewish roots. Now, if we look at the New Testament, there are only so many passages we can find about Mary. In Luke, you have the Annunciation, you have the Visitation, you, in, in Matthew, uh, the, the visits of the Magi at the Nativity scene where Mary is there. In John, you have 
the wedding at Cana where she appears. There is some passage where she comes to call for him because they, they're worried about him. And then uh, she reappears again at the cross in the Gospel of John. And pretty much that is all of the passages in the Gospels. And then the letters of Paul and the other letters don't really speak about Mary. And she reappears again. In the book of Revelation in chapter uh, 12, we have where the woman appears, clothed with the sun, uh, a crown of 12 stars and standing on the moon. And scholars will debate, is that Mary or is that not Mary? Because her name is not mentioned there. These are a few uh, of the sources we can take from, from the scriptures regarding Mary when we look at the New Testament. So, if we then look at Catholic dogma, uh, Catholic doctrine about Mary, we believe, for example, that Mary, in the, first, in the virgin conception of Jesus, that Jesus was conceived in the womb of Mary without Joseph's involvement, and uh, without any kind of marital relationship. Um, yeah, basically, there was no sex involved. Uh, but from God himself, uh, she conceives in her womb. Uh, using her ovum, uh, her ovum conceives, so therefore she is truly uh, the mother of God. We can find a clear scripture reference for that. But what about uh, some of the other beliefs that we have about Mary? For example, about the virgin birth. Uh, and, and I want to note here that the virgin birth is different from the virgin conception. Uh, often people... Uh, uh, use the two uh, kind of conflated uh, and most people that speak about the virgin birth actually mean the virgin conception but uh, the, our belief about the virgin birth is something different and then what about her perpetual virginity that she remained a virgin uh, all her life what about the immaculate conception what about Mary being without sin throughout her life and what about her bodily assumption into heaven where do we find any references in scripture uh, okay the bodily assumption perhaps we could take from Revelation 12 a little bit there, but it's in some way marginal. So understanding Mary solely based on the New Testament will give us some trouble in explaining fully what we believe about Mary. Which is then why Protestants may say that, is there any biblical basis for the Marian devotion and what you believe about Mary? And is this all tradition? Okay. Now, yes, there is tradition plays a, a big role in that, but let's explain again then tradition correctly. But it's not just going to be tradition. It's going to be scripture. But if we're going to look at scripture, perhaps one big mistake that many people make when it comes to looking for Mary in scripture is that they only look at the New Testament. And looking at only the New Testament gives us a lot of problems because we're not looking at the whole picture. If we want to look at Mary, we have to go back to the Old Testament. And it is what most scholars fail to do. Any, any books, especially those that are written in criticism of Mary and devotion, uh, and then looking at Scripture, only look at the New Testament. And perhaps and that's kind of mistake number one. And so in this study, uh, when we look at Mary in Scripture, we are not just going to look at the New Testament. We're going to spend a fair bit looking at the Old Testament. Because when we look at the Old Testament, then we will discover some things about Mary that will help us understand that many of these devotions and all of our doctrine has scriptural basis. Has scriptural basis. Okay, so... There are three lenses that we are going to use in this study to look at Mary. Okay? The first lens that we're going to look at is, uh, or not, not the first, but one of the lenses we're going to look to is tradition. And tradition here is written with a capital T. Okay? Because uh, in the church we have tradition with a capital T and we have tradition with a small letter T. Okay? Uh, when, when, when Christmas comes along and you decorate your house with... Uh, uh, you, you have a Christmas tree and, 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 and there's certain decorations you use. That is tradition with a small letter T. And we're not talking about that type of traditions. We have all kind of traditions, all kind of like things that come along the way, how we do them. Uh, 
and, and many, and they, they, they are not wrong, but they are tradition with a small letter T. More important in the church when we talk about tradition is with a capital T. And tradition is one of the sources of our faith. There are three things that always work together in our understanding of faith. It is scripture, tradition, and the magisterium. These three working together. How do we understand Christ? Christ is the source of all that we believe. and He is the fullness of the revelation. So we need to look at the person of Jesus. But how does the person of Jesus come to us in our understanding of this public revelation? Okay. Uh, and it, I'll make it another distinction between public revelation and private revelation. Public revelation is all that happens in the Old Testament and then fulfilled in Jesus. So Jesus is the public revelation of who God is. And that's why when Jesus says, if you see me, you see the Father. Yeah, so Jesus is the fullness of all our understanding of who God is and what God came to reveal. By the death of the last apostle, the last kind of eyewitness who walked with Jesus uh, from the start of his public ministry till his uh, ascension into heaven, then uh, the church concludes that public revelation has come to an end. Okay? There is not going to be any more public revelation. So all that we know about God and all that we need to know about faith has already been revealed and there will be no future revelation that is going to add anything. Okay? There is not going to be any future revelation that is going to add anything to this public revelation. All we need to know is already revealed. So for example, we believe in the triune God. Why do we believe in the triune God? Because Jesus clearly reveals the triune God in his life he refers to the father and he says the father and i are one and then he refers to the spirit that he will send and then he says you will baptize them in the name of the father the son the holy spirit and there are other biblical passages that we can see about how, why we believe even though the word trinity is not in scripture protestant and, and catholics alike will agree that the bible clearly teaches the concept of trinity and that's why we believe that now there cannot be some kind of apparition neither of mary nor of any of the saints or somebody that says, I had an epiphany, and now God has revealed to me there are not three persons in the Trinity, there are four persons in the Trinity. The church will immediately reject that because that goes against public revelation. And there cannot be an addition to public revelation. All that we need to know is already revealed. Now, it already being revealed... There is such a process in the church in which what is already been revealed is unpacked in a greater way. It is discovered in a deeper meaning. And that's why we continue to do Bible study, not just on this level of trying to understand Bible, but even by scholars who really are going, digging deep into the Scriptures in order to understand its full meaning. Yes, sometimes what is already revealed is being discovered more. And this very much applies to Marian doctrine, that some of the pronouncements about Mary, for example, about the Assumption into Heaven or her Immaculate Conception, they happened in the last two centuries. So then some say, well, for 18 centuries you didn't believe this, and then all of a sudden, no. We, we go back to tradition, to the early roots of, of what did the early Christians believe. And we already discovered that they already believed this. The pronouncement came centuries later, but there are early sources for this. And there are scriptural sources for it. So one source we're going to look at is tradition with a capital T, and between brackets I put patristics, meaning that this is about uh, what do the church fathers say about Mary. Okay? The church fathers are often saints, bishops, that lived in the first seven centuries of the church especially in, in the 3rd century, 4th century, 5th century, that uh, kind of the, the, the high life of the patristic sources. Uh, but some are even earlier. From the, uh, uh, there are, for example, St. Ignatius of Antioch is one that lived, uh, that, that already knew St. John himself. Uh, so there are very early patristics and there are late patristics. But they kind of form the source of what we call tradition. What did the church fathers say about these? 
and many of the writings of the church fathers are scripture reflections. They read the scripture and they explain it. They are homilies, they are letters. So we will look at some of these sources. The second lens we will look through is a Christocentric view, meaning all we are going to look at Mary is through Jesus. We are not going to study Mary as if she is kind of some kind of um, person in and of herself or by her, or alone that has some kind of like separate role that has nothing to do with Jesus. No. Anything we are going to look at, at Mary has something to do with Jesus. And that's why her role is so significant. Uh, if, if you pray, for example, the litany of Mary, there are many... Uh, many of the litanies, that, uh, the, the, the titles that start with Mother of, uh, Mother of Jesus. Uh, but even if you come up with, with some kind of other phrase, title, Mother of, all these titles are references to Jesus. Because she's only one mother, Mother of Jesus. Any other title actually is a reference to Jesus. And so uh, the, um, calling her the Ark of the Covenant has something to do with Jesus. Uh, and we will discover that. Okay? And this is what the Catechism says about this second point uh, in CCC 487. What the Catholic faith believes about Mary is based on what it believes about Christ. And what it teaches about Mary illumines, in turn, its faith in Christ. So what we understand about Mary comes from our understanding about Christ. And what we understand about Mary helps us then to... Uh, strengthen our faith in the person of Jesus. We understand Mary and her role as the mother of Jesus. So, we want to look at Mary, we have to look at Jesus. Okay? And thirdly, and I'll, I'll explain this a bit, bit further, is what we call typology. And I've already made this point in this sense that if we want to understand Mary, we can't just look at the New Testament. We need to look at the Old Testament. In theology, we use this word for that. It's called typology. Okay, typology or other words that we sometimes use is foreshadowing or prefiguration. So, the New Testament, we understand the New Testament in light of the Old Testament. So, the Old Testament is in some way the shadow and the New Testament is the real person. You know, just as when you stand in the sun, a shadow is cast on the floor. So, this shadow... So imagine Jesus standing, the sun is shining at Jesus, and a shadow is cast. Now this shadow we call the Old Testament. The real person is Jesus. Okay? So Jesus is the real deal. The Old Testament is the shadow of Jesus. And the shadow came first. So we first see the shadow, and then finally we see the real person appearing. When you see the shadow coming, you know the person is coming. And so the Old Testament works like that. The Old Testament is a foreshadowing announcing the coming of Christ. And so when we look at the, sh at the shadow, we can discover, not always very clearly, but uh, if, if, if there is a very bright sun, the shadow even becomes clearer. And in some way, the Old Testament is a quite clear shadow in which, hey, we already see some of the features that are about to come. The prophecies that announce the coming of the Messiah. That's foreshadowing. Another word that we use is prefiguration. So the figure is coming, but there is a prefigure. And this prefigure is an announcement of the figure to come. So uh, these are all um, synonyms, uh, typology, foreshadowing, prefiguration. The idea of typology then is that the Old Testament you find the type, and in the New Testament in Jesus you find the real deal. For example, eh? the Ark of Noah foreshadows baptism. Eh? Going through the waters is a form of baptism. Eh? And the Ark itself then becomes a foreshadowing of the church. Where do we find its fulfillment in the scriptures? In the boat of Peter. And Jesus entering into the boat of Peter. Eh? The boat of Peter becomes a very important concept in the New Testament. And that is, we are all in the bark of Peter. We are all in the church. So the Ark of Noah foreshadowing the boat of Peter, foreshadowing the church. The crossing of the Red Sea, prefigures baptism. They went uh, through the waters 
and they came out on the other side from slavery to freedom. And that's what baptism does. And it's the scripture itself in many of the letters of Paul in which he already applies this kind of typology. St. Paul writes about how in, in the book of Exodus, Moses hid on the rock and water came from the rock. And then what does Paul write in his letters? This rock was Christ. And water gushing from, from his side, we see it on the cross. And what is that water? It's baptism. And blood. What is that blood? The Eucharist. So, foreshadowing typology. Uh, Abraham was visited by three visitors, by three angels. And the church has seen in this visiting a, a foreshadowing of the Trinity. And he was visited by God himself uh, in the form of these three angels. Uh, and, and we see in that a foreshadowing of the Trinity. Now, making it more clear then on typology itself, is that in the Old Testament we have types of Christ. So Adam was a type of Christ, Isaac was a type of Christ, Joseph was a type of Christ, Moses was a type of Christ, David was a type of Christ. They, in their person, show us something of the Messiah, of Jesus who is to come. And that's why then we refer to Jesus as the new Adam, the new Isaac, the new Joseph, the new Moses, the new David. Adam, the first disobedient one, who led to the death of all, Christ, the new Adam, who is the obedient one and brings life by dying for us. He gives life to all. And so he becomes the new Adam. What Adam screwed up eh, is restored by Jesus as the new Adam. Isaac, eh, Abraham had to offer his only son. We look at that story. What happens? They go to this mountain. This mountain of Moriah is where present-day Jerusalem is. So he's making his way to Jerusalem. How does Isaac travel? He travels on a donkey. How does Jesus enter Jerusalem? On a donkey. Then when they reach the mountain, Abraham makes Isaac carry the wood of the sacrifice. When Christ goes onto the mountain of Calvary, what does he carry? He carries the wood of the sacrifice, the cross. Abraham offers his only son. Christ, the only son of the Father, is offered for us. Finally, uh, an angel stops Abraham, and, and you don't need to, he, because he already sees his willingness, and then instead a ram is offered. This ram was caught with his horn in the thorn bush. Who dies for us on the cross? One whose head is also caught in a, turn, in a thorn bush in the crown of thorns. And he becomes, that, just as that ram becomes the replacement sacrifice, and so Christ becomes our replacement. So you see, I'm just giving you this as an example of how typology works. David, what was the prophesy to David? For those who just attended the Bible timeline, you'll know. The prophecy to David is that forever a descendant will sit on your throne. Forever a descendant will sit on your throne. But if you have followed the Bible timeline, you know that, yes, the descendant of David, Solomon sat on his, and then his son and his son and his son. But then the kingdom split. Yeah, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and then uh, eventually both kingdoms go into exile. And there is no more person sitting on the throne of David. So, God wasn't faithful to his promise? No, he was. And he eventually fulfilled that promise, not in the way by your son sits on the throne, your son sits on the throne, your son sits on the throne. But once and for all, he fulfills the promise when Christ, the son of David who is the eternal king, who is the eternal God, sits on the throne of David forever. In one person, it is fulfilled once and for all. Because this person is forever. And so, the prophecy to David was fulfilled, and therefore Christ becomes the new David, who unites the kingdom, who brings us back into the fold, and he will rule forever. Now, Catholics and Protestants both agree on this approach to Scripture, that we look at in the Old Testament for typology. If you read the Church Fathers uh, and their reflection on Scripture, they see typology everywhere. They see typology that we see. They also sometimes see typology that we don't see. Uh, they, they, they were sometimes a little bit wild in their typology. Uh, um, any piece of wood uh, also is the cross. Uh, uh, and that's okay. Typology. So all Christians... Orthodox, Protestant, Catholics, 
all agree on this approach to Scripture to look for typology. And what is this typology? What the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of Jesus. Or sometimes foreshadowing of, for example, the church, the Ark of Noah being a foreshadowing of the church, or water being a foreshadowing of baptism and so on. So why not Mary? Why not Mary? And this is where Catholic Bible scholars, Orthodox Bible scholars on one side, and Protestant scholars on, on the other side, don't really see eye to eye. Because Protestants feel comfortable looking for typology about Jesus in the Old Testament, and perhaps some references to the church or to baptism, but not Mary. Whereas in the Orthodox Church and in the Catholic Church, Scripture scholars, supported by the Church Fathers, also see foreshadowings of Mary in the Old Testament. Typology about Mary. So, if Christ is the new Adam, then Mary is the new Eve. And this is what we're going to focus on today. If Christ is the new David, then Mary is the new Ark of the Covenant. If Christ is the new David, then Mary is the Queen Mother. The Queen Mother. And uh, in one of the sessions, we will also discover how Mary is the new Rachel. Uh, but if I'm going to explain that, it's going to take me too much time. So. And we see prophecies being fulfilled in the New Testament. And this, actually, even Protestant scholars will agree on, that Isaiah is prophesying that the virgin will conceive, uh, announcing the virgin conception. So we see how there are prophecies that are explicitly about Mary. The virgin will conceive, yes, it, it speaks about Jesus because he's the one that is being conceived, but it also speaks about the virgin. And there is this role of the virgin in the story of salvation history already prophesied by Isaiah, and Mary is the one in whom it happens. And she is that virgin that conceives Christ, the Messiah, in her womb. And so if we're going to look at the Old Testament then we will indeed find sources, scriptural sources, for the virgin birth, the perpetual virginity, the immaculate conception, Mary being without sin, and Mary's bodily assumption, and some of the doctrines that we believe about Mary. This is the introduction, and now I'm going to go into Mary as the new Eve. These are the three lenses we're looking through. Tradition, what did the church ought to say? What did the early Christians basically say about Mary? What has Mary to do with Jesus and looking at her from a Christocentric view and looking at typology? How is Mary foreshadowed in the Old Testament? And so we're going to look at typology from the Old Testament and then link it with the New Testament passages of Mary and see how they come together and how they are being fulfilled.